to Jesus, make you all believe us. Decide is the best side. Give your life to Jesus Christ. So do the last ride. Sometimes the hard decision you must make, you can choose Jesus Christ, so keep heading for your faith, but when it's too late, don't scream for I'm being, cause I'm giving you your chance right now to live again. Sometimes the hard decision you must make, you can choose Jesus Christ, so keep heading for your faith, but when it's too late, don't scream for I'm being, cause I'm giving you your chance right now to live again. Hey, hey, how's it going? Jesus Christ worldwide. I need to be out, sanctified. One of the Holy Ghost fields. Ain't no shame in my game, so I'm wrapped for sin. Both the only son of God. Yeah, he's so Hello. Hey, hey, what's going on? Hey, how's everything going? Can you guys see me? My my um video is you better take a read. No, you have to. There you go. You have to hit the video. Are you going to the baseball game? For me? <laughs> I, this is the church hat. You got the ACLG hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, how you doing, Donna? Good to see you on Facebook Live. Be sure to share it on your page so that people can uh, join in with us. We'll get started here in a little bit. People probably coming in from shoveling their snow to get your hot chocolate, your coffee, your apple cider, whatever it is you want on a cold night like tonight. We got a nice uh, schedule to go for tonight, so I'm looking forward. I see Dr. Hayes got water. That's good. Yep, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to talk if I can. <laughs> yes, everyone will have an opportunity to share whatever they want to share. You 
few more moments. Y'all get a lot of snow out in the city. Yeah. Every rhyme on new chapter, every line of verse. Mm -hmm. It seems that this world's going around in a hearse. The master physician, spiritual technician. Man, you can't stop the results of God's mission. Subliminal, so deep and individuals. Just to get me out of your head, post your I think we'll go ahead and start at 705. Well, we have started, but this is what people supposed to mingle, say hi to each other. Do all those kind of things. So at 705, we will move into our peaceful conversation. I think I got some questions that people will really be uh, interested in chiming in on. So we'll be uh, happy to hear what people's thoughts and views are on some of the questions of the day. So we want to keep, we want to not um, block our videos. We want everybody to see everybody. So we can have community. We've been um, physical distancing for so long and not being able to see each other's faces and have some type of camaraderie, some kind of able to see how people are doing, get to see smiles and just feel like we kind of connecting. Principalities, them the ones calling the shots at the snap of a finger. You can lose all that you got. So security definitely guarantees that you have a place in heaven. That's a fact you can believe and mortify. Ready to throw things in this war. No fear because I'm being led by the Lord. This is rain. Who else is on Facebook? Dream, but I hate it for those who ain't there. If you're on any other Facebook page other than the Hots Ministries, please go to the Hots Ministries Facebook page. That way I can see your comments. I can't see your comments comments on Reverend Isaac Hayes's page you got to go to the healing of the soul ministries Facebook page so that I can see your comments and make sure that we are including you uh, in our conversation well it's 705 and so we're going to go ahead and, and get started with our uh, peaceful conversation so uh, we don't want to stampede on the capital like we had a couple <laughs> Everybody, please uh, keep uh, themselves and their conversations respectable and Christian-like. And so I am going to open in a word of prayer just before we go ahead and, and dive in into today's agenda. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you and praise you and honor you for Cafe Manna. We thank you for this opportunity just to get together as believers and people of faith to uh, converse with one another, to fellowship with one another, to be in community as you've called us to be. So I pray that you will bless our time together, that it will be encouraging and inspirational, and we'll give you the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so my first question uh, uh, or topic of conversation is about our evangelical brothers and sisters. Uh, because the relationship between the black church and white evangelicals uh, seems to be growing farther apart. Um, for whatever reason, Donald Trump has driven a wedge or exposed a major tear between the black church and the white evangelical church. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the relationship between the white evangelical church and the black church. Now, for me, uh, th this is a, a, a uh, difficult conversation because I am raised and work for a black church, but uh, both of the seminaries that I have went to are white evangelical seminaries. So I understand how white evangelicals think, I understand how black Protestant thinks, and uh, even though our doctrines tend to align when it comes to issues of race, um, there seems to be differences of opinion, even though both sides argue for the unity of the church, that we're one in Christ, that we're all made in the image of God. Uh, uh, this uh, relationship between the evangelical and the black church. So your question. What are your thoughts about the relationship between the white evangelical church and the black church? 
I think that it all depends on who um, the individual are because um, we are, I believe there is a separation with, with church, churches. I don't think that there is necessarily a, a unification unless you have someone like the um, T.D. Jakes, who's definitely a part of that type of organization, but I, I don't know. For me, I, I think it's separate. But I mean, the race relationship, if we're both Christian, if we're all a part of the body of Christ, why do we seem to have a growing tension and a, a growing schism between the white church and the black church? Give me an example. Well, <laughs> we see a major crisis going on in the Southern Baptist Convention that while uh, five presidents of Southern Baptist Convention uh, universities, seminaries to be exact, uh, released a statement condemning racism, but they also rejected um, critical race theory. And so even, uh, and because of that, a lot of black pastors in the Southern Baptist Convention are pulling out. One is Dwight McKissick, who has been most prominent. He used to be a president of the SBC for some time and a former member of the SBC 20 years ago, re just wrote a letter to him and basically said that, um, you know, Negroes, don't have the intellect that when we talk about things of race and, and moving forward, that it is divisive uh, in the church. And so we see what's going on with the evangelicals and their support of Donald Trump, irrespective of his views on race and, and how he stoked all those racial flames. And so what is our thoughts about that? What can we do about it? Let me ask it that way. What is what is the church going to do? If we are the church of Jesus Christ, there is no Jew nor Gentile. There is no slave nor free. There is no male nor female in terms of equality and status. But yet we see that because of the history of America, white evangelicals still have not fully embraced their black brothers and sisters. Well, I think it's because in their minds, they don't feel like there is uh, necessarily racism, especially those who, who do partner with uh, other black churches or have them participate on their conferences or where they are in some type of relationship when it comes to providing gospel, you know, letting, allowing them to be on their platforms or coming to the African-American pastor's platform, maybe they don't even see that racism is really happening because they're not experiencing it. I think it's the same as what's happening secularly. Okay. Uh, Donna Bailey, who's on uh, Facebook uh, Live said, because they're racist. <laughs> And, and so we, we have a challenge. We, we, we have to figure out how do we have a conversation around race where our views, our feelings, our experiences are not so easily dismissed. Because the reality is if, if the church of Jesus Christ in America doesn't lead the way in resolving this issue, uh, then America is not going to follow suit. That every major movement in race relations in the United States of America has always been led by the church, whether it was abolition, whether it was the civil rights movement, but it, we have always been at the front. And the difference today is that for the first time in African-American history and happy African-American month to everybody is that the civil rights movement, quote unquote, is being led by a secular organization, i.e. Black Lives Matter. 
which has views, even though we support their concept and understanding that Black Lives Matter and we agree with that, they also, though, in their platform as an organization, have views and promote lifestyles that are contrary to scripture. And so that's part of the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention's issue with critical race theory is because they pick and choose some of the, let's say, less um, um, acceptable aspects of it, like Marxism and so forth, uh, and other type communism and those types of things. And so they say we throw in the whole baby out with the bathwater, but it's really a ploy in my estimation to cover over the fact that they don't want to deal with race. So we won't, we don't want to affirm black lives matter because they support non-traditional marriage or, you know, they, they, they are, um, have different views about different lifestyles and gender and sex and so forth. So because of that, we gonna dismiss that Black Lives Matter because critical race theory, some of it, some of it may have its roots in, in Marxism. So we're gonna throw that out too. Now, anybody else wanna uh, share a, a comment, a, a thought about this, about the white evangelical church and uh, the black church in America? Any, any other views? Thoughts. Okay, well, here's another one. This, this is a little more closer to home. That might be a little too esoteric. Um, but we know we are in COVID-19 uh, season. We, we, we know that since March of last year that our churches have been completely shut down or we have been restricted in the number of people that we can have to worship in our sanctuaries. And so my question to you is that, do you prefer in-person or virtual worship? Because mm -hmm. now that we've had the opportunity to experience worship on a Sunday morning Bible study from home or wherever we are and in the building, what is your preference in terms of worshiping online or worshiping in the building? Well, I think I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll speak right now. My preference is um, worshiping at home because of the COVID-19. But I, I do feel like when things um, get better, I would prefer to be in the in the household of faith. I would love to be around the saints, experience um, worship uh, in a mm -hmm. sacred place. Mm -hmm. But for now, I just think it's, it's just safer. Okay. Any other thoughts? Jennifer, you raise your hand, let me... Uh, bring you in here. There you go. I am always glad to be in the service. I, I love worshiping and praising God with the house. I do. I love that. But um, I've also been enjoying worshiping at home. I get to go to a bunch of different churches and be fed a lot of different things while I'm here. Like I I listened to some John Hannah and then some Michael Todd and some Keon Henderson. It's like, I'm enjoying worshiping at home as well as I am glad to be in the service. So it's working both ways. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you a question. If you had a preference, which one would you choose? I would be in the service. I would be in the service. So in your estimation, what's the difference between worship, worshiping virtually and worshiping in the building? The atmosphere, I would like to say. Um, you know, I'm a single mom, so it's easy to go interrupted here or somebody coming in and saying something to me. So I, I, I would definitely say the atmosphere. Okay. I see uh, Ruby Bailey said that she would rather do it in person. However, everybody cannot attend safely. That's true. Donna Bailey, 
uh, said that she would rather worship in person as well. Any other thoughts on that? In in the building or, or worship virtually? Well, I think for myself and the building is wonderful because there's, there's a sense of family there. Um, I do miss that worshiping from home. Um, I'm by myself when I'm worshiping at home. So I find I, I tune into God better at home because as soon as I, as soon as the service is over with, there's some one-on-one -on -one time where I actually sit and go back through the Bible, go back to some of the scripture, go back to some of my mental notes. And I actually have a little devotional time after service. Whereas if I know I'm at the church, it becomes more of, congregational conversation you know it becomes more fellowship and we miss the fellowship we like to catch up with our saints and everything but I find that I'm more I, I find that being at home I am tuning into God much more and spending more time with him uh, versus coming to church and then leaving and talking chit-chatting and then when I go home I don't really pick that bible back up that night but if I had a preference, I would rather be in the in the house. I would think that um, just for that familiarity and being with family. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So, so you have an opportunity then to process mm -hmm. when you're at home. Yes. So you don't have to worry about right. I got to get my cold, or I got to get up, and, mm -hmm. and we got to dismiss. Mm -hmm. And so that 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 moment that you have for the spirit of God to mm -hmm. speak to you and for you to rest in that mm -hmm. moment you don't get in the sanctuary so exactly we have an atmosphere in the sanctuary mm -hmm. we don't get the process time in the sanctuary exactly <laughs> exactly and i'm not diligent enough to go home and pick that bible back up the side i find a thousand other things to do but when I'm home and I'm watching it, I immediately turn to my computer or my Bible and I'm still writing notes, I'm still studying, I'm still reading. And I go into my own prayer at that time too. It gives me time for that one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, uh, Jackie, I saw you were, I think you I, 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 I can say I honestly agree with, uh, with, with, with Sister Deborah. I, I feel the same way. Um, it's that connection of the saints that I miss, that connection of the family, that connection of the of the congregation. Um, but I, 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 also, I also agree with her that I find I'm spending more time, more time with the devotions, more time with my Bible, more time, um, as Jennifer said, just listening to other uh, pastors um, on different facilities. So it's I think it's mainly it's it's that connection with the saints that I'm mainly missing. I, I I'm like Deb. I would I would not come home on Sunday and and turn my Bible. I would not look at my Bible. Where I find is more. I'm I'm spending more time doing that now. Okay. Yeah. I uh, I think there's a Barner study that say about 25 percent, 25 30 percent of uh, church attenders do watch other pastors, other ministries mm -hmm. online. So it gives you an opportunity, right? We, we don't want to eat from everybody's plate as, as they used to say <laughs> back in the day, but it helps to fill in the gaps, right? Because yes. your mama cooked one kind of way. You go to somebody <laughs> else's house, they cook it a, a different way. Doesn't necessarily right. mean that their mom is a better cook than your mom. They just mm -hmm. fix the food differently. Right. So I, mm -hmm. I, I think what happens uh, with all of this technology, with YouTube and Facebook and live stream and all of these things is that people now have greater exposure to different levels of ministry. Some preachers deal more on the black power, you know, more socially conscious. Mm -hmm. Others are more psychological uh, and therapeutic in their, in their presentations. Other are more kingdom oriented. Others are more prophetic in, in how they present the scriptures. Others are more theologically or biblically oriented so mm -hmm. it gives you an opportunity to um fill in your gaps to do those areas of weakness it's sort of like when you work out right you have to do exercises in different angles you have to get on different machines in mm -hmm. order for you to get the nuance of those muscles and so that's what 
the kingdom provides us with this additional exposures that we now have access uh, to even greater uh, information. Any, anybody else want to? Uh, uh, all right, Ruby, you see, is like I'm getting my praise on right here. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so anybody else on that? Nope. All right. Well, here's here's another question for the community. <laughs> Um, and that's about church and the celebrity culture. And has it gone too far? Um, if, if you look at what happened with um, Hillsong's New York, right? That's the church that uh, Justin Bieber went to and mm -hmm. Kevin Durant went to. And their pastor was, was like a celebrity pastor. He, he wore uh, very expensive clothes. Uh, he likes he hung out with all of those celebrities and superstars, and he had a moral failure. Uh, you you have a, a pastor in South Carolina. I'm not going to say his name. Mm -hmm. He, you know, uh, is a celebrity. He was a comedian, come from a very large church, wearing very expensive uh, shoes uh, mm -hmm. as well, three four hundred dollar Yeezys or Jeezys, whatever they call. <laughs> and so one of the criticisms today now is that pastors have become part of a celebrity culture. And so what, what, what do you all think about today? Ha, have pastors become too celebrity driven? You know, we got to have the tailored suit. We, you know, we got all of these uh, accoutrements now. You got all of this security. You, you got to have all this packaged uh, PR kind of stuff now. Uh, in order to operate in today's world. And some people are arguing that because of this celebrity culture, we're seeing the result of all of this moral failure because our pastors have been lifted up and put on a pedestal beyond just being a spiritual leader. Mm. Mm. All right, I hear laughing. I don't hear no talking. <laughs> Any thoughts? So, so you do? Do we think that there is no celebrity culture, and we are okay? We don't think that the pulpit has went too far. Um, I think it's in the same place it's always been. It's just now it's more exposed. So little things that we knew that were going on in the church that was not supposed to be going on in church, more people have access to see it without coming inside of a church or knowing anyone that visits or worships at a particular church. Um, it is a lot of pastors that have been exposed on several YouTube channels or Facebook or one of their members get upset and go on Facebook live. It, it's been there. It's just the world can see it more open now. And for everyone that says, well, that's why I don't go to church. Now they can go back to an article, a newspaper or a video on a website to prove their point as opposed to, well, I heard from somebody who went here um which is what they used to have to do prior to now so but it, it's, it's the same just more exposure seeing it not just getting to church because these people are rubbing elbows with celebrity they always have it was no camera phones there okay. or what i always tell jen mega churches are murdering religion and that's just my my personal opinion of what i've seen over the last 20 years Okay, so you, you're saying that pastors have always been celebrity, but now because of technology, they're being exposed, or do you think that exposure is driving the, um, driving the celebrity piece? Well, yeah, I mean, because we I think the world will see them as celebrities as opposed to us, us being the people in the church. To us, they're just the pastor, you know, that's pastor. That's not the famous pastor, it's your, it's your pastor. So it's 
it to, to us is not a, a big deal, but to the world it is, especially when they fall short of something and then they grow. You get more popularity living in sin as a pastor than you do living right with the world, not with your congregation. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned about some of these YouTube uh, undercover reporter, investigative reporters is what I'm gonna call them. I call them, uh, well, I ain't gonna say what I'm gonna call them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not fond of these people. Me either. I, you know, I, I, particularly the Christian ones, these other folk I can't do nothing about. But I do have issue because I don't understand their motives. It, they're not, in my opinion, they being messy. They, they're not trying to help the church. They just being messy to generate revenue through their social media pages, in, in my opinion. They, they, they are Wendy Williams type individuals, mm -hmm. male and female. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't absolve the pastors for what they and and the music artists and all these other folk for doing what they're doing because if you kissing people and recording it and posting it on instagram you you mm -hmm. asking for it you know mm -hmm. uh, if you letting people take pictures of you at the hotel room it and you can't be them. mad at them when they post it so so i'm well, not you know. absolving them but i i really question the motive of, of, of these so-called uh, investigative reporters. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? So in, in that vein, and then we'll wrap this up uh, for the peaceful conversations, I, I want to connect this now to Kanye West mm. because we saw him do his worldwide tour of the Christian churches and, and all of these uh stadiums and stuff he was having these worship services and everybody was on bandwagon kanye but now where is where is he at right now after his album has come out um i i don't know if i haven't seen anything from the church of kanye uh and so do you think we were bamboozled Snoop came out with a Christian album, right? Oh, and it was good too. I got, I got it. <laughs> it's, oh, it's real good. <laughs> okay. What was good about it? The whole thing. He got different gospel artists on his, um, on his uh, CD. It's real good. It's really good. Different church choirs, groups. It's really nice. Mm hmm Now, now. But Add, adding another layer to this, we saw um, somebody was with Lil Wayne, did a song with him on one of his records. We saw Tasha Cobbs did something with, um, uh, who, who was that with? Somebody who's very Nicki provocative, Minaj. Nicki Minaj you, or one of them. Yeah, and, it was okay. It. It'll do. So, mm -hmm. so my, that's what I'm asking. Huh? We, we talk about mixture, right? And, 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 and particularly in the Old Testament, but it carries over into the New Testament that, you know, God instructed the children of Israel not to mix the material that you were using, not to mix the seed. He, he was very specific about them not mixing things because it was a spiritual principle embedded in that. And so when we see gospel artists doing duets and songs with gangster rappers and <laughs> women who promote promiscuity. Is that what the church should be doing? Again, it's about celebrity culture because we're partnering with a Lil Wayne or Nicki Minaj or Me Megan Three Stallion or whoever, because <laughs> the church is trying to use the celebrity status of those individuals to get more people to be aware of their music. And so that's what I'm saying about the celebrity culture in the church. Is it a problem? Is it an issue? It would, well, I mean, if, if that's their motive, then yes. But if it's to get a message across, 
to an audience who wouldn't typically listen to their music just for the message and not for sales, then we got to kind of, that, that, that's the difference. And how do we know which, if they're, which one? How do we know if they're trying to get a message or they're trying to do a We won't, sale, but, right. but we won't. Right. Right. We, we, well, we just like when I message. was when I was younger, people were, were upset about Kurt Franklin. Mm -hmm. They know that's, that's the era true. I came up mm -hmm. on. They they were upset yeah. about Kurt Franklin. So he's still upset about. Well, <laughs> <laughs> they they were upset about mm -hmm. you know that he had more up tempo songs that would that would get more radio play on nine gospel radio stations mm -hmm. and that was okay. a big issue so okay. and even he did it that didn't even start he used salt from some pepper on stump so this is that's not true it's, <laughs> nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. it's just done more now mm -hmm. So we so get back to your original argument that it ain't nothing new. This what we're seeing today is an acceleration mm -hmm. and an uncovering of what's already been going on. Mm hmm You know, because um the, the pastor, um, what's his name, Jenkins, when he came out with that song, um, This is War, mm -hmm. or whatever, yeah. when he was singing that, there was a lot of controversy around that. You know, the fact that he was up templed and you know, the even the video, you know, a lot of people didn't like the video, but he bought a lot of younger people to listen to him. And I think a lot of times we got to look at which which culture of people that the upbeat singing and the dancing or whatever, who is it really reaching out to? Because the seasoned saints, I would say, is my age, I'm 63, it might not hit me as, mm -hmm. as it would someone that's in their 30s. You know, I would listen to it, shake my head to it or whatever, but it's not something that I'll thrive to keep hearing. You find the younger people, once they get a song, get it in their head, and then they start looking for a like song to continue that momentum that's going on. And that's what brings them closer to, to just hearing of God's word it, through the music, through the dance, through the uh, the hoopla and all that but right. if the same person my age or so would sit down and hear it we hear once once or twice and okay it's pretty cool but after that we've had enough of it it's like bring me back home bring me back to my hymns or whatever i think it i think it the celebrity part is it's out there but i think it's for a certain generation it's just focusing on certain people i don't think it's being bought out to take a global effect on anyone. I think they're targeting certain ones with their music. Okay. And that, yeah, and you know, Elder Hayes, that it may just, that message may only reach one person, but as long as that message is reached. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So we're saying in, in theology, they kind of say, it can have redeemable properties. Right. Even mm -hmm. bad right. things can have redeemable qualities and properties. God right. can take anything and use it to right. carry out his will and his purpose and his plan. So, right. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. And I see you, uh, Sister Ruby, you say it depends on their motive. And, and I think, you know, uh, God is the ultimate judge. Who, who are we? You know, we, we have to make judgments we don't judge people, but we can make judgments, as uh, Dr. Bay Brazier likes to say right. from time to time, that we can make judgments. And so, mm -hmm. uh, welcome, Michael, to, to Cafe Manor. Glad to have you with us. Um, Praise and, the Lord. Praise. Praise, how are you doing? Doing great. Sorry I'm joining late, but uh, glad to be joining regardless. I'm sorry. Glad to have you in here. All right. And so I, I want to move to... Um, I want to move to the um, prophetic call for tonight. And that is uh, from the thought, it's under control. It's under control. And it comes from Exodus 3, 7, and 8. And it says, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their 
taskmasters, for I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing. That particular text, and, and, and then I'll go. Uh, one is God sees. God sees. When, when God talked to Moses, he said to tell the people that I have surely seen their affliction. We sometimes feel like God is not aware of what's going on in our life because of how long we've been in it, uh, how difficult it may be. We wonder if God is looking at our situation, if he's looking on our situation, because we know that God is everywhere. We, we know that God is omnipresent and he knows all things. He's omniscient. But yet for our little bitty puny circumstances, which are major to us, we sometimes feel like God doesn't see what's happening because how can these difficulties how can these challenges come in our life and God not do anything about it? it it's what Job was wondering right when he was going through and he's saying God how can you allow this to happen don't you see how unfairly I'm being treated what's happened to my family to my possessions to my health and that's what the children of Israel were going through. They had been in slavery for 430 years. And they're saying, does God see how these taskmasters are treating us? Doesn't he see how cruel they are to us, how they're working us um, unmercifully? Even our ancestors during a time of slavery the Hebrew, Negro spirituals and all of those things we sing today come from a people who were saying, God, don't you see what's happening to us, that we were taken from one continent and brought across the ocean to another continent, stripped of our dignity, stripped of our pride, stripped of our history, stripped of our language. And, and do you see what's going on? And the answer from God to Moses for the children of Israel and for us tonight is yes, God sees everything you're going through. He, he's looking at it right now. He's aware of every second, every moment, every hour, God sees what's happening in our lives. The second thing he says for Moses is tell them that God hears, that I've heard your cry, that we pray to God, we cry out to God, we ask for his intervention. We ask for his blessing. We ask for his deliverance. And it sometimes feels like God has both of his fingers in his ears, ignoring our cry. But he's saying, Moses, I hear him. I, I hear you every time you pray. I hear you every time uh, you are wetting your pillow. I hear you every time you're down on your knees or you're in your car and, and you're wondering what's going on and why God is allowing these things to happen. And he's saying, I hear, I hear. My, my, my ears are not too dull. The prophet said that I can't hear you. God hears everything that we say. In fact, the apostle John says in his epistle that if we ask anything of the Lord according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, we have the petition whatsoever we desired of him. And so he doesn't always respond the way we want him to respond. He doesn't always respond in the time that we want him to respond, as they had been waiting over 400 years for God to do what he was going to do. But he still wanted them to know that I hear. I see what you're going through. He wants us to know tonight that he hears our prayer. He may not do what we want. He may not respond as quickly as we would like. But the one thing we can be certain of is that our prayers are making their way up to heaven. The third thing he says is that God knows. He says that I know their sorrows. I, I love that phrase. It, it's, it's more than an intellectual understanding. 
but it is an experiential knowledge. Like some things you know because you read it in a book. Like I, I knew about Times Square because I see it on ABC7 every morning uh, during their morning broadcast. But I experienced Times Square when I finally had an opportunity to go to New York City. So there's a difference between knowing intellectually and, as it, and then another thing to know experientially. And so what Jesus, what God is saying to Moses, to the children of Israel and to us is that he knows our sorrow. Well, how can God know our sorrow? Through his son, Jesus Christ. He was a man of sorrows, the Bible says. He experienced pain, heartache, betrayal, hunger, uh, uh, all kinds of denial from Peter and others. He understood every human and understands every human predicament, every human condition. The author of Hebrews says that we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That means that when we cry out to him, when we wonder if he sees what's going on, Jesus feels it. He knows our sorrow and he can advocate to God, the Father, and intercede to the Father on our behalf because he knows what we're going through. He's sympathetic and empathetic uh, to what it is that we are experiencing. And so he wants us to know that he feels our pain because sometimes it gets heavy. Sometimes we want to throw in the towel, but God sees, he hears, he knows. And because of all that, the last thing he says to Moses, I have come down. God comes. He comes to our situation. That situation that we wonder, did he see? That prayer and those prayers that we wondered, did he hear? Those sorrows that we wondered, does he know? He affirms all of the above by coming into the midst of our situation. See, he doesn't send something, he comes to it. Yeah, you have to recognize that, that he personally responds to what he sees, what he hears, and what he knows by coming to us. Now, how did he do that for the children of Israel? He came to them through Moses. Moses didn't create himself. God created Moses. He protected Moses. He gifted Moses. He put Moses in Pharaoh's house because he had a plan and a purpose for Moses's life, not just to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage, but when they got out, they had to become a nation. So they needed somebody who could write laws. They needed somebody who understood military strategy, who knew how to write treaties and all these kind of things. And so what I'm saying is that God is coming to your situation. It's under control, but he sometimes has to make all of the necessary preparations so that after your deliverance, you make it to the promised land. You just don't want to get out of slavery out of your situation, and then Pharaoh's army catches you at the Red Sea and destroys you. You don't want to get on the other side of the Red Sea and not able to defeat Og of Bashan and Sihon of, of Heshbon. You want to be able not to die in the wilderness, but to make it to the land that flows with milk and honey. And so when he comes into the midst of your situation, he's going to come with everything you need to make it to where it is that God wants for you to go. So our, our prophetic call on tonight is that it's under, it's under control. So as we enter into our time of, of, of our community prayer, uh, is, is there anyone who has any, any prayer requests? You can unmute yourself and, and we will uh, go ahead and, 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 and take prayer requests. If you're on Facebook Live, I, I see you, Mimi. Thanks for, for joining us. Share your prayer requests on Facebook Live. If you have a prayer request here, you can uh, type it in the chat, I believe, is, is how we're doing that. To, to, I can read through them as I pray and as we pray together. And remember again uh, that we're praying together. I will lead the prayer, but I want you to look in that chat. I want you to look on Facebook Live, and I want you to pray 
for the prayer requests uh, that we see in there. Uh, again, uh, we're not doing Ephesians 1 prayer requests where one sentence was 14 verses long, uh, but we're doing short prayer requests uh, so that we can um, make sure that we get through them all as, as much as possible. So let's uh, put your prayer requests on Facebook. Let's put our prayer requests uh, in the chat here on the Zoom. And I'm going to ask that everybody will join in with me in praying. I will have you all muted so we don't cancel everybody out. But please pray audibly uh, right where you are. Uh, and so let's pray. Lord, we just come right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you, God, for this night, for this opportunity, for Cafe Manna. We thank you. Uh, that everything is under control, Lord, that you see, that you hear, that you know everything that's happening in our lives, and Lord, that you're going to come down to deliver us. And so, Lord, I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice, no matter what they're going through, no matter what affliction, no matter what hardship, no matter what level of oppression, whether it's spiritual oppression, mental oppression, physical oppression, people oppression, financial oppression, Lord, that you will come down and deliver. I pray that you will heal every broken heart. I pray that you will wipe away every tear from every eye. I pray that you will make a pathway in the wilderness and a roadway in the desert. I pray that you will do a new thing, God, in this season, in the life of your people, Lord, that as we are gathered together for community, God, we're not here for a church service or a worship service, Lord, but we're here to have conversation. We're here to pray for one another. We're here, Lord, yes, to receive a brief word of encouragement, but most important, we are adhering to your word in Hebrews 10, 25, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We are here to continue, Lord, in the tradition of the early church, in fellowship and in prayer and in the apostles' doctrine and in the breaking of bread. So, Lord, I ask for your healing power. I pray, Lord, for uh, Deborah, Lord, for diligence and staying strong and focused uh, uh, in this uh, season, Lord. I pray that you will give her focus, that you will give a clarity of thought that you will give her, Lord, keen insight into the direction that you would have for her to go. I pray for Michael, Lord, that you will bless his family and that you will bless all of those who are suffering, Lord, that you will provide and supply all that they need, that you will continue, Lord, to hear their cry, that you will see their affliction, that you will uh, impose yourself and intervene in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of their tragedy. We pray for their safety and protection from COVID-19 and from uh, other dangers and uh, evils in our society. I pray, Lord, for those who are in need of healing, for Dr. Hayes for healing and those spiritually and physically, for the household of faith, for the body of Christ, for those uh, saints of God in China uh, who are being put in camps, for those uh, saints in the Democratic Republic of Congo who are being taken out for those uh, saints in Myanmar whose communities suffered an air raid, for those uh, saints in India who are being persecuted and in North Korea, uh, Lord, who are being persecuted. Lord, I pray for Jennifer that she will have a focus, Lord. We know that your word says that you will keep our minds in perfect peace if our minds are stayed on you. And so, Lord, I pray that she would not be distracted as your word says, that she would not turn to the left hand nor to the right, but that she will look to Jesus, the author and finisher of her faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Lord, I also pray uh, for strength and wisdom for Mimi, that you would, Lord, guide and undergird her, for your word says to be strong in the Lord and in the power uh, of his might that she is to put on the whole armor of God, that she may be able to stand in the evil day. So Lord, I pray that you will bless her with the strength that she needs, with the courage that she needs, with the wisdom that she needs. For your word says that wisdom is the principal thing and with all thy getting, get an understanding. So God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this season in human history that you've allowed us to be a part of. And we just pray 
that you will strengthen our hands for the work, that you will bless us, cause us to prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. And we will give you the honor, the glory, and the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody can say amen. Go ahead and unmute yourself and give God praise. We thank you on Facebook. Amen. Give God praise. Amen.